23 famous serial killers who are still alive. This is a list of serial killers, who are still alive. When serial killers are caught, after a long period of horrific, evil crimes, it's almost expected that their lives will be coming to an end. The usual sentence for multiple murders, especially ones committed by serial killers, is death. So that's why it's so remarkable, to hear about serial killers, who are currently still alive, most of whom are serving life sentences in prison. Very few serial killers, who have been caught have been released from prison, but there are still some odd exceptions, where the law and morality don't intersect. Who are these serial killers, who are still among the living? How did they escape a death sentence while on trial? What were their crimes, and who were their victims? How did these serial killers murder their victims? This list answers these questions, and more about some of the world's most notorious living serial killers. Many famous serial killers were murdered in jail. The male and female serial killers on this list, either received life sentences, or managed to avoid life in prison. These rare serial killers may have taken the lives, of at least three people, some with victim numbers over 50, yet are still alive. 1. Charles Manson. Born in Ohio in 1934, Charles Manson is notoriously connected to the brutal slayings of actress Sharon Tate, and other Hollywood residents, but he was never actually found guilty, of committing the murders himself. However, the famous Tate La Bianca killings have immortalized him, as a living embodiment of evil. Images of his staring mad eyes are still used today to illustrate countless serial murder news stories. The Manson family including Charles Manson, and his young, loyal dropout disciples of murder, is thought to have carried out some 35 killings. Most were never tried, either for lack of evidence, or because the perpetrators were already sentenced, to life for the date, La Bianca killings. In 2012, Manson was denied parole for the 12th time. The first victims fell on August 9, 1969 at the home Roman Polanski had rented located at 10,050, Kilo Drive in Benedict Canyon, an area just north of Beverly Hills. Manson chose four of his most obedient comrades Charles Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian to carry out these heinous crimes. Kasabian acted as the getaway driver, and was to become the star witness during the trial. The victims inside the house, actress Sharon Date, writer Wojciech Frykowski, and his partner, the coffee bean heiress Abigail Folger, and celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring, had returned to the Polanski residence after dining out. Polanksi himself was away in London shooting a film. The first victim was 18-year-old Stephen Parent, who had been visiting his friend William Gerritsen, who took care of and lived in a guest home, on the Kilo Drive property which Polanski, and Tate rented. He was spotted by the intruders, and was shot as he drove away from the house, in the dark early morning hours. Kasabian was horrified by the shooting of the boy, and she remained outside to keep watch. When the other three broke into the house, they herded the occupants into the living room, and tied them up. Manson himself took no part in the actual killings, but directed his murderous disciples to the address, and instructed them to kill everyone. According to one of the family members' statements, the Polanksi household had been targeted, because it represented Manson's rejection by the showbiz world and society. J. Sebring was shot and brutally kicked as he tried to defend Ms. Date. During the terrifying fracas, both Frykowski and Folger managed to escape from the house, but were chased and stabbed to death. At the trial, Kasabian described how she saw Frykowski staggering out, of the house covered in blood, and was horrified at the sight. She told him she was sorry, but despite her pleas to his attacker to stop, the victim was bludgeoned repeatedly. Folger escaped from the house with terrible injuries, but was caught on the front lawn and stabbed 28 times. 2. Dennis Rader, BTK. Dennis Lynn Rader was born on March 9, 1945, in Pittsburgh, Kansas. From the 1970s to the 1990s, the BTK killer which stands for Bind, Torture, and Kill terrorized the Wichita, Kansas area. In 2005, 
he was finally caught and revealed to be Dennis Rader, a seemingly average married father of two. The oldest of four sons, Rader grew up in Wichita, Kansas. There may have been signs of trouble, early on as a Los Angeles Times report stated, that he used to hang stray cats as a child. Rader served in the U.S. Air Force, from the mid to late 1960s. He married his wife Paula in 1971, and worked for a camping gear company for a few years. He went to work for ADT Security Services in 1974. That same year, Rader committed his first crime. On January 15, 1974, Rader killed four members of the Otero family in their home, Joseph and Julie Otero and two of their children, Josephine and Joseph Jr. They died by strangulation, and Rader took a watch and a radio from the home. Strangulation and taking souvenirs would become part of his modus operandi, or pattern of behavior. He also left semen at the scene and later said that he derived sexual pleasure from killing. The Odoro's 15-year-old son, Charlie, came home later, that day and discovered the bodies. The BTK killer struck again a few months later. Waiting in their apartment on April 4, 1974, Rader killed Catherine Bright, by stabbing and strangling, and attempted to kill her brother, Kevin. Kevin was shot twice, but survived. He described Rader as an average-sized guy, bushy mustache, psychotic eyes, according to a Time magazine article. Despite his cat and mouse game with authorities, Rader was able to keep the lid on his secret, murderous life. He continued to work at ADT. On the surface, Rader was reportedly an attentive husband and father. He and his wife had their first child, a son, in 1975 and a daughter in 1978. The next year, Rader graduated from Wichita State University, with a degree in Administration of Justice. Still he continued to taunt authorities, and appeared to be poised to strike again. In April 1979, Rader waited in an elderly woman's home, but he left before she came home. He sent her a letter, to let her know that the BTK killer had been there. In an effort to catch him, the authorities released the 1977, recording of the phone call to police, hoping that someone might recognize the voice. After several years without a known crime, Rader killed his neighbor Marine Hedge, on April 27, 1985. Her body was found days later on the side of the road. The next year, he killed Vicki Widgerl in her home in September. His final known victim, Dolores Davis, was taken from her home on January 19, 1991. It is not known why Rader seemed to stop killing. He had left ADT in the late 1980s, and started working as a Park City, compliance supervisor in 1991. In his new position, Rader was known to be a stickler for the rules. He measured the height of people's lawns, and chased stray animals while toting a tranquilizer gun. According to reports, Rader took pleasure in exerting his limited authority over his neighbors, and other members of the community. He was also a Boy Scout troop leader, and an active member of his church. With many news stories marking, the 30th anniversary of the Odero murders, the BTK killer resurfaced in 2004. Rader sent local media outlets, and authorities a number of letters. These were filled with items related to his crimes, including pictures of one of the victims, a word puzzle, and an outline for the BTK story. During 2004 and 2005, he also left packages with more clues around, including a computer disk. That disk helped lead authorities to Raider's church. They also noticed his white van on security, tapes of some of the package drop-off areas. Authorities were also able to obtain a DNA sample from Raider's daughter, which helped cement their case against him. Raider was arrested on February 25, 2005, and later charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. Some neighbors and members of his church, where he served as president of the church council, were stunned by the news and could not believe that the man they knew was the serial killer that had haunted the area for so long. To the surprise of many, Rader pled guilty to all of the charges on June 27, 2005. As part of his plea, he gave the horrifying details of his crimes in court. 
Many observers noted that he described the gruesome events, without any sign of remorse or emotion. He escaped the death penalty, because he committed his crimes, before the state's 1994 reinstatement of the death penalty. Rader is currently serving 10 life sentences in a Kansas prison. 3. Dennis Nelson Dennis Nelson was born November 23, 1945 in Fraserburgh, Scotland. Though Nelson recognized his homosexual desires, he was never comfortable with them, and began acting on them through murder and dismemberment. Nelson's first victim was in 1978, he went on to kill, upon his confession, 12 young men and dissect their bodies. In February 1983 a tenant, at 23 Cranley Gardens in Muswell Hill, complained that the toilets were blocked, and the Dino Rod Company was called in to investigate. What they discovered in the drains would lead to the arrest, of one of Britain's most prolific serial killers. Dennis Nelson, a 37-year-old civil servant living in the attic, had murdered at least 15 men in the space of five years. In many cases he would keep the corpses, in his home for several months before cutting them up, and disposing of them, either on a bonfire or by flushing them down the toilet. He would later confess to having sex, with the dead bodies of his victims. The first known victim is 14-year-old Stephen Holmes on December 30, 1978. Nelson invited him back to his flat, at 195 Melrose Avenue in Cricklewood, strangled him with a necktie, and then drowned him in a bucket of water. Eight months later Nelson burned the body in the garden. On December 3, 1979 Kenneth Ockenden, a 23-year-old Canadian student, was invited back to the same address and strangled. He was followed by 16-year-old Martin Duffy, on May 17, 1980, and 27-year-old Billy Sutherland, in August 1980. Nelson admitted to killing seven other unidentified men, and keeping their bodies under the floorboard, before the murder of Malcolm Barlow, 24, on September 18, 1981. He burned five of them on a bonfire at the back, of his home on October 4, 1981. The next day he moved to 23 Cranley Gardens. The first victim at the new flat was John Howlett in March 1982, exact age and date unknown. He was followed by Graham Allen, in September 1982, age and date unknown, and finally Stephen Sinclair, 20, on January 26, 1983. Nelson was arrested two weeks later on 9 February, after the discovery of human flesh in the drains. When questioned by detectives at the flat, he feigned shock before showing them two bags, full of body parts in his cupboard. During the summing up, the judge dispensed with the majority, of the psychiatric jargon that had perplexed the jury, by instructing them that a mind can be evil, without being abnormal. The jury retired on November 3, 1983, but were unable to reach a unanimous verdict. The following day, the judge agreed to accept a majority verdict and, at 4.25 p.m., they delivered a verdict of guilty on all six counts of murder. The judge sentenced Dennis Nelson to life in prison, without eligibility for parole for at least 25 years. 4. Charles Cullen While working as a nurse over the course of 16 years, Charles Cullen killed at least 35 victims, although the suspected number is actually in the hundreds. He killed patients through overdoses, and medical contamination in New Jersey, and Pennsylvania hospitals. Cullen was arrested in 2003, and sentenced to 127 years in prison. Since then, investigations into the hospitals, that employed Cullen have revealed, that some may have been aware, that he was harming patients without taking any measures to stop it. Charles Cullen was a critical care nurse, who admits to killing up to 40 people, some suspected was a lot more. The murders took place over 16 years in seven different hospitals. There were suspicions at nearly, all of them that Cullen was harming patients, yet none of them passed that information on to subsequent employers. Newspaper headlines called him the Angel of Death, but as you will see, Charles Cullen was no mercy killer. Until we interviewed him a few weeks ago, he had never spoken publicly about his crimes never tried to explain why he did it, 
or even express remorse to the families of victims, when he finally faced them in court. Thomas Strenko, this monster didn't even know us or our son, but had the audacity to end his life. Richard Stuker, I'd like to tell you a little about my mother, that you murdered. You don't even have the guts to look this way do you? Clara Hardgrove, Charles. Why don't you look up at us? I'd like to show you what you did to our children. This is their dad in his coffin. How do you like that? This was the scene seven years ago, at the Somerset County Courthouse in New Jersey, as Charles Cullen sat through his sentencing hearing, refusing to speak, or even acknowledge the family members, of people he had murdered. Even the judge was exasperated. Judge Paul Armstrong, Mr. Cullen, I asked you a question dot 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 why is it that you have chosen not to address the court? Can you hear me, Mr. Cullen? He's kept that silence behind the walls, of the New Jersey State Prison in Trenton, where he is in protective custody to keep him safe from other inmates. Protecting himself from his own demons has been more difficult. We found out when we sat down across from him, in a cramped cubicle separated by a thick layer of glass, to talk about the people he's killed. Steve Croft, is 40 an arbitrary number? Charles Cullen, 40 is an estimate. I gave a number between 30 and 40. I think I have identified, you know, most of them. Steve Croft, look, you pled guilty to murder. But you don't use that word. Charles Cullen, I think that I had a lot of trouble accepting, that word for a long time. I accept that that's what it is. Steve Croft, do you consider yourself a serial killer? Charles Cullen, I mean, I guess it depends upon a person's definition. If it's more than one and it's a pattern, I guess then yes. In Cullen's case, all his victims were patients assigned to hospital units where he worked as a nurse. They range in age from 21 to 91. Some were critically ill. Others were ready to be discharged when Cullen injected them with drugs that would kill them. It was a pattern that began 26 years ago at St. Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston, New Jersey, Cullen's very first nursing job. Charles Cullen, I worked on the burn unit. So, I mean, there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And I didn't cope with that as well as I thought I would. Steve Croft, and that was the first place that you gave someone medication that caused them to die? Charles Cullen, yes. The patient was John Yengo, a judge from New Jersey, who was suffering from a severe case of sunburn, until Cullen injected him with a fatal overdose of lidocaine. Steve Croft. Do you remember the person? Charles Cullen, I mean, I remember one and that's the only person, I've been able to identify. But there could have been more dot 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 St. Barnabas didn't know about the patient Cullen murdered, but it did suspect him of trying to kill or harm a half dozen other patients by randomly, and repeatedly poisoning bags of saline solution. 5. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. Berkowitz's killing spree began on July 29, 1976, with the shooting of two teenage women, outside a Bronx apartment building. At the time of the attack, Donna Loria and Jody Volante were sitting in Volante's car, in front of Loria's home. Berkowitz shot the two women, killing Loria and injuring Volante. Three months later, Berkowitz struck again. He shot at a couple sitting in a parked car, severely damaging the man's skull. That November, Berkowitz attacked two teenage girls walking home. He shot both of the girls, leaving one of them a paraplegic. At the time, the police did not think these shootings were related. In January 1977, Berkowitz again targeted a couple, sitting together in a car at night. He walked up to Christine Freund, and her fiancé and fired twice, striking Freund in the head. She later died of her injuries. For all of his shootings, Berkowitz used the .44 caliber gun. Before long, the police would create a special, task force to hunt down the .44 caliber killer. That March, Berkowitz claimed another victim. Virginia Voskrikian, a college student. He killed her as she returned home from classes. The next month Berkowitz killed a couple, Valentina Suriani and Alexander Esau, in their parked car. 
This ruthless killer began taunting the police, leaving a letter for a police captain near the scene. In his note, Berkowitz called himself the son of Sam. Berkowitz's final attack occurred in the early hours of July 31, 1977. He shot another couple, Stacy Moskowitz, and Bobby Violandi, in Brooklyn. Moskowitz later died, and Violandi was blinded in one eye, and lost most of the vision in the other from his injuries. Fortunately for the police, a witness noticed something at the scene that helped in cracking the case. At the scene of the Moskowitz Violanti shootings, a witness saw a man getting away in a car that had a parking ticket on it. Only a handful of tickets were given out that day, and one of them was for Berkowitz. The police arrested him on August 10, 1977. According to the New York Times, Berkowitz said, Well, you've got me when they took him into custody. During questioning, Berkowitz explained that he had been commanded to kill by his neighbor Sam Carr, who sent messages to him through Carr's dog. He told me to kill. Sam is the devil, Berkowitz said. Many months were spent on determining whether Berkowitz was fit to stand trial. He underwent numerous psychological evaluations. In August 1978, Berkowitz pled guilty to the six killings. He later received 25 years to life for each murder. Berkowitz is currently serving a life sentence, at Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York. Since entering prison, he has become a member of the Jews for Jesus religious group. Berkowitz has refused to attend any of his parole hearings, since he became eligible for possible release in 2002. He was rejected for parole in 2014. His case will be reviewed again in 2016. In a New York Post report, Berkowitz's lawyer, Mark J. Heller revealed the infamous killer isn't interested in parole, because he believes that Jesus has forgiven him and set him free. Berkowitz's crimes have become the subject, of numerous books and documentaries, including 2001 Summer of Terror, The Real Son of Sam Story. Spike Lee also explored the effect Berkowitz's reign of terror had on a New York neighborhood in the drama Summer of Sam, 1999. 6. Wayne Williams. Wayne Bertram Williams was born on May 27, 1958, in Atlanta, Georgia. Little has been reported about Williams's early life, but his public journey to infamy began on July 28, 1979, when a woman in Atlanta came across two corpses hidden under bushes at the side of the road. Both were male, black and children. Edward Smith, 14, reported missing a week before, was shot with a 22 caliber weapon. The other victim, 13-year-old Alfred Evans, was reported missing three days before. Evans was murdered by asphyxiation. This discovery would mark the start of a string of killings lasting 22 months in Atlanta that became known as the Atlanta Child Murders, and it would continue in late September, when Milton Harvey, age 14, was also found dead. The end of 1979 brought two more child victims, Yusef Bell had been strangled, and Angel Lenair was tied to a tree, with her hands bound behind her, also strangled. When two more bodies continued the trend into the spring of 1980, and a seven-year-old girl was reported missing, the FBI was called in to help local police. They launched a major investigation, and an FBI profiler worked on the case as well. To this point, the bodies of the victims were found in wooded areas, but in April 1981, the killer changed his mo. The bodies were now being dumped in the Chattahoochee River. This allowed investigators to narrow their search, and they soon staked out all 14 bridges that spanned the river in the Atlanta area. In late May, a group of law enforcement officers on surveillance at the river heard a loud splash around 3 a.m. on the bridge. A car fled the scene and the police pursued and pulled it over. The driver was Wayne Williams, a 22-year-old black freelance photographer. The police had no idea what the splash was at this point, so they had to let Williams go. Two days later, however, the body of Nathaniel Cater, 27, was found downstream, and Williams was brought in for questioning. Williams's alibi proved weak, and he failed several polygraph examinations. 
On June 21, 1981, Williams was arrested, and on February 27, 1982, he was found guilty of the murders of Cater, and another man, Jimmy Ray Payne, 21. The conviction was based on physical evidence, matching fibers found on the victims, and in Williams' personal possessions, and eyewitness accounts, and he was sentenced to two consecutive life terms. Once the trial was over, law enforcement officials declared their belief that, evidence suggested that Williams was most likely linked, to another 20 of the 29 deaths the task force had been investigating. DNA sequencing from hairs found on different victims, revealed a match to Williams' own hair, to 98% certainty. But that 2% doubt was enough to prevent further convictions. While subsequent efforts led by his own protestations, were mounted to prove Williams innocent, the killings stopped once he was imprisoned. 7. Donato Balincia Balincia was born in Potenza, Basilicata, in 1951. When he was about five years old, his family moved to northern Italy, first to Piedmont and then to Genoa and the Liguria region. He was a chronic bedwetter, until age 10 or 12, and his mother shamed him, by placing his wet mattress on the balcony, where it could be seen by the neighbors. When undressing him for bed, his aunt would shame him by pulling down his underwear, in front of his cousins to show his underdeveloped penis. At age 14, he decided to start calling himself Water. He dropped out of high school, and worked at jobs such as mechanic, bartender, baker and delivery boy. While still underage, he was arrested and released for stealing a motor scooter, and for stealing a truck loaded with Christmas sweets. In 1974 he was stopped, and jailed for having an illegal gun. At some point he was committed, to the psychiatric division of the Genoa General Hospital, but escaped. After he was apprehended, he spent 18 months in prison for robbery. He served several prison terms in Italy, and France for robbery and armed robbery. In spite of his history of psychiatric problems, up to age 47 he had no record of violence. Valencia was a compulsive gambler who lived alone. His first murder was the October 1997 strangulation of a friend, who betrayed him by luring him into a rigged card game in which he lost £185,000, about $267,000. The authorities originally thought, this death was a heart attack. Balinch's next two murders were the revenge shooting, of the game's operator, and of his wife. He emptied their safe afterward. Balinch later said these first killings gave him a taste for murder. In all his killings he used or carried a .38 caliber revolver loaded with wad cutter ammunition. He made no attempt to conceal his victims' bodies. That same month, he followed a jeweler home to rob him, then shot him and his wife dead, when the wife began screaming. He emptied their safe of jewelry. He next robbed and murdered a money changer. Two months later, he killed a night watchman making his rounds, simply because he did not like night watchmen. He killed an Albanian prostitute and a Russian prostitute. A second money changer was killed next, shot multiple times and his safe emptied. In March 1998, while receiving oral sex at gunpoint from a prostitute, he shot and killed two night watchmen who interrupted, then shot the prostitute, who survived to help develop a police sketch and later testify against him. He also killed a Nigerian prostitute and a Ukrainian prostitute, and robbed and assaulted an Italian prostitute without killing her. On April 12, 1998 he boarded the train from Genoa to Venice, because he wanted to kill a woman. Spotting a young woman traveling alone, he followed her to the toilet, unlocked the door with a skeleton key, shot her in the head and stole her train ticket. Six days later, he boarded the train to San Remo, and followed another young woman to the toilet. He used his key to enter, then used her jacket as a silencer, and shot her behind the ear. Excited by her black underwear, he masturbated, and used her clothes to clean up. The murders of two respectable women sparked a public outcry, and the creation of a police task force. In his last killing before his arrest, Valencia murdered a service station attendant, after filling up with bedroll, then took the day's receipts, about 2 million lira, about $1,000. 
Based on the description of the black Mercedes, one of his prostitute victims was seen entering the night she was killed. Police considered Gulinch suspect number one, and followed him for 10 days. They collected his DNA from cigarette butts and a coffee cup, matching it to DNA found at crime scenes. On May 6, 1998 he was arrested at his home in Genoa, and his revolver seized. After eight days in police custody he confessed, speaking for two days and drawing 17 diagrams. On April 12, 2000, after an 11-month trial, Balincha was sentenced to 13 terms of life imprisonment plus, an additional 20 years imprisonment for the attempted murder of the prostitute who survived. The judge ordered that he never be released. 8. Kristen Gilbert Meet Kristen Heather Gilbert, a smart, accomplished RN, but a troubled soul. In her youth, Kristen Strickland was known as a pathological liar. According to friends and neighbors, she often made the unfounded claim that she was a distant relative of the infamous axe murderer Lizzie Borden. Ex-boyfriends described Kristen as strange and controlling, eventually exhibiting a pattern of verbal and physical abuse toward them. For attention, she would fake suicide attempts, or when angry, she would tamper with her boyfriend's cars or physically attack them, scratching them with her nails. Nevertheless, she graduated high school 1.5 years early, with high honors, and then enrolled in a state college and majored in pre-med. Kristen got a job as a home health aide with a visiting nurses association. During her tenure there, she once scalded a retarded child with hot bath water, burning over 60% of the boy's body, but was never prosecuted for the incident. In 1988, Kristen earned her degree as a registered nurse. In the same year, she met Glenn Gilbert, and the couple eloped. It was not an ideal marriage from the start. Early on, during an argument, Gilbert chased her husband through the house with a butcher knife. Shortly after her marriage, she landed a job at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Northampton, Massachusetts, working on Ward C. In 1990, the Gilberts had their first child, a son. After returning from maternity leave, Kristen switched to the 4 p.m. to midnight shift on Ward C, and almost immediately, strange things began to happen. During her shift, an unusually large number of patients began dying due to cardiac arrest, tripling the rate of deaths over the previous three years. During each incident, Kristen's calm and competent nursing skills shone, and she won the admiration of her fellow workers. The couple's marriage began to fall apart after the Gilbert's second son was born in 1993. At that time, Kristen was developing a friendship with James Perot, a newly hired VA hospital security guard. He worked from 3 p.m. until 11 p.m., and the two often went to have drinks with other workers at the end of their shifts. Anytime there was a medical emergency on Wardsey, James was called to the scene. In the fall of 1994, the relationship between Kristen and James moved from friendship to romance. Soon afterward, Kristen's husband began to notice the food Kristen served him had an odd taste to it. Although nothing was ever proven, Glenn Gilbert became convinced that his wife was trying to kill him, telling friends that she wanted him dead by Thanksgiving. When James presented Kristen with an ultimatum to leave Glenn, or end their relationship, Kristen immediately left her husband and two sons and moved into her own apartment, and their affair blossomed. The unusually high death rates during her shift continued. In fact, Gilbert was jokingly given the name Angel of Death by her co-workers because so many people died while under her care. However, there was nothing amusing to a few of the nurses on the ward. The whispers about Kristen continued but many chose not to believe she would be involved in something as sinister as killing patients. Others were not so trusting and began to monitor drugs that could cause cardiac arrest. One such drug, epinephrine, kept coming up missing. Unofficially, Ward C was under the close eye of a handful of the nurses assigned to it. Under Gilbert's care, four patients were dead and three others had succumbed mysteriously to near-fatal heart failure. Added to that was the inexplicable shortage of epinephrine. Although many of the patients who died were elderly and in serious condition, there were also patients who, although sick, had no history of heart problems. 
yet were dying of cardiac arrest. She was even accused of killing one patient so that she could leave early for a date. It got so bad that in 1996, three nurses came forward to report their fear that Kristen was a killer, and their concerns inspired an investigation. Authorities interviewed all the employees on Ward C and put together a grisly motive for why the death rate had tripled. According to the prosecutors, Gilbert stole a pinephrine from the hospital stock and used the drug to induce massive heart attacks in her victims. It was surmised that Kristen administered a pinephrine to patients so that her lover, James, would be summoned to the ICU, where she could then be close to him, and impress him with her skills as a nurse. It also allowed her time to flirt with him, as was witnessed by several of her co-workers. Gilbert's behavior became unpredictable. She purchased a toy to disguise her voice and called the VA hospital while Perot was on duty. She told him that three bombs were set to go off in two hours in building one of the hospital. Employees and patients, many of whom were sick and elderly, had to be evacuated. Gilbert was arrested, tried, and convicted for this apparent attempt to divert the investigation against her. She served 15 months in federal prison for falsely phoning in a bomb threat to a federal institution. During her prison term, federal investigators exhumed several of the bodies of those who died during Gilbert's shift at the VA hospital. Just as the nurses feared, a toxicology analysis found epinephrine in their tissues, and since that drug had not been prescribed to any of the victims, there was no reason for it to be in their bodies. During the investigation, Gilbert was not working, and immediately, the death rate on Ward C dropped to normal. After Gilbert left the hospital, her relationship with Perot began to dissolve. Her temperament began to get more volatile as the finger pointing became firmly directed at her, and Perot began to pull away. In June 1996, he decided to end the relationship. Gilbert pleaded with him to continue the relationship, to no avail. A month later, Gilbert overdosed on drugs and was admitted to a hospital psychiatric ward. In 1998, Gilbert, aged 30, was indicted for murdering four of her patients and attempting to kill three others by injecting them with a pine of Perot eventually testified against his former lover, reporting that Gilbert had actually admitted to him one day that she'd killed her patients by injection. It was discovered that in the seven years she worked at the VA hospital, 350 deaths had occurred during her shift. In 2001, she was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder, one count of second-degree murder, and two counts of attempted murder. Because these crimes were committed on federal territory, the government could have given her the death penalty. However, she was sentenced to four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole plus 20 years, and is serving her time in a federal prison in Texas. 9. Beverly Ullett the serial killer nurse Beverly Ellett must serve a minimum of 30 years in jail for the murder and abuse of children in her care, the High Court ruled today. A High Court judge ruled that Ellett, dubbed the Angel of Death, should serve a minimum sentence of 28 years and 175 days, taking into account the one year and 190 days she spent in custody before being sentenced. Ellett was given 13 life sentences in 1993 for murdering four children, attempting to murder another three, and causing grievous bodily harm with intent to a further six, at Grantham and Castavon Hospital in Lincolnshire. Mr. Justice Stanley Burton, sitting in London, confirmed the minimum sentence of 30 years, which is the same term previously recommended by the trial judge, and the then Lord Chief Justice. Ullett will be 54 before she will be considered for parole. The former nurse was diagnosed as suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy MSBP, when she carried out the attacks between 1991 and 1993. The 39-year-old is now being held at the Rampton High Security Hospital in Nottingham. Ullett murdered the four children by injecting them with high doses of insulin. MSBP is a condition identified by the pediatrician Sir Roy Meadow in 1977 and described as a form of child abuse in which carers deliberately induce, or falsely report illnesses in children to focus attention on themselves. The judge said, I have to say that I regard the determination of the minimum period in a case such as the present, 
and fortunately cases as extreme as this are rare, as a very difficult task. Once it is accepted that the offender was suffering from mental disorder, difficult ethical and indeed philosophical questions arise as to the degree to which responsibility for the offenses in question should be regarded as diminished. I have found that there is an element of sadism in Emzelet's conduct and her offending. But that sadism is itself, if not the result, certainly a manifestation of her mental disorder, and it would be unduly simplistic to treat it in the same way, as one would if the offender were mentally well. By her actions, what should have been a place of safety for its patients became not just a place of danger, but if not a killing field something close to it. The four children murdered by Lit were seven-week-old Liam Taylor, 11-year-old Timothy Hardwick, two-month-old Becky Phillips, and 15-month-old Claire Peck. They all died between February and April 1991, while Lilit was a nurse at the Lincolnshire Hospital. Nine other children survived her murder attempts. Lilit was subsequently found to have been the only nurse on duty, at the time of all the poisonings. The judge said, these were multiple murders and attempted murders of young children, whose lives were snuffed out almost before they had begun. Having considered all the medical evidence, he was satisfied that she was suffering from an abnormality of mind when she committed the offenses. Joanne Taylor, the mother of Elit's first victim, Liam Taylor, said she was pleased with the judge's verdict and his reference to Elit's sadism. Taylor, who was in court with her husband, said, that's what we all felt at the time. There's a fine line between evil and illness, and I'll never forget him saying that word today. David Beck, of Newark, Nottinghamshire, and the father of 15-month-old Claire, who died in March 1991, said, I'm absolutely delighted with the outcome, and pleased for the other families as well. We can now put this behind us after 15 years. I couldn't ask for anything better. Claire, who suffered from asthma, was admitted to hospital and collapsed when Alit was alone with her. Alit was convicted of her murder after the jury heard evidence that the toddler had been injected with potassium and lignocaine. 10. Paul Bernardo The lawyer for the families of Paul Bernardo's murder victims say, they are devastated by the news that the notorious killer is scheduled for a day parole hearing next year, but knew this day would come. Tim Danson a lawyer for the families of 14-year-old Leslie Menfi and 15-year-old Kristen French, has confirmed that Bernardo's preliminary hearing for day parole is scheduled for next March. In 1995, Bernardo was convicted of raping and murdering the teen girls. He was sentenced to life with no chance of parole for 25 years. Bernardo became eligible for day parole after serving 22 years despite his designation as a dangerous offender. If granted day parole, Bernardo would be permitted to leave the prison during set times, and then return at night. Danson told CTV News Channel on Tuesday, that he is confident that Bernardo's request will be denied, and that the convicted killer will spend the rest of his life behind bars. However, Danson said he and his clients are taking nothing for granted. We will be preparing the victim impact statements, and participating in the parole hearing," Danson said. Nevertheless, I am confident that he will not be successful. Danson said though the Mahaffey and French families knew this day would come, they are devastated by the news that Bernardo is seeking day parole. It's gut-wrenching, Danson said. It's hard to believe they have to confront this all over again. That they have to disclose, in a public hearing the most private feelings and emotions, which is very difficult. He said the families have adapted to life following the horrific murders of their daughters to the extent that it's humanly possible, and then something like this just brings it all up again, and it's torture for them. Danson added that it will be tough for the families to be in the same room as Bernardo during the hearing, but they understand that it is part of the legal process. I think what overtakes them is to still be there for their daughters, and to make sure that Paul Bernardo doesn't get out. Holly Knowles, a spokesperson for the Parole Board of Canada, says Bernardo became eligible for day parole on February 17, 2015. He is eligible for full parole in 2018.
Danson said Bernardo's dangerous offender designation is a very significant finding that, he believes must be considered. Before the parole board considers the normal criteria, for parole eligibility, our view is that they must deal with the dangerous offender designation, that Paul Bernardo will have to put forward a compelling, and reliable medical evidence that would displace the evidence, that was put forward over 20 years ago, for which he was found to be a dangerous offender. Knowles told the Canadian press that dangerous offenders, are not to be conditionally released by the parole board, unless and until they are deemed to be no longer an undue risk to the community. Signing privacy laws, Knowles said she could not comment on Bernardo's case. However, Knowles said a dangerous offender designation is taken into consideration, along with psychological assessments, and victim impact statements, during a parole board's decision-making process. 11. Carla Homolka Canadian serial killer Carla Homolka has resurfaced in a suburb of Montreal, City News has learned. Homolka who was convicted in 1993, to 12 years in prison in the deaths of schoolgirls, Kristen French and Leslie Menfi, is living in Chaitgui, Quebec, with her three children. Breakfast Television Montreal reporter, Dominic Fazioli has confirmed that Homalka is living in a home in the city, of 45,000 in southwestern Quebec. Homalka is now going under the name of Leantio, Fazioli has confirmed. Two of her children are attending a local public school. Hamalka lived in Quebec following her 2005 release from prison, where she married Thierry Bordelais, and gave birth to a boy. Bordelais is the brother of Hamalka's lawyer during the high-profile murder trial. The pair had two more children together. According to the Canadian press, she moved to the Antilles to escape media scrutiny in 2007. In 2012, Journalist Paula Todd found Hamalka living in Guadeloupe. In the first-degree murder trial of Luke Magnata in 2014, Hamalka's sister revealed that she was back in Quebec. Hamalka and her then-husband Paul Bernardo were arrested in the 1991 and 1992 rape murders of Melfi and French, as well as the rape and death of her sister, Temi. Hamalka told investigators that Bernardo had abused her and testified against him in exchange for a reduced prison sentence. Bernardo was convicted of first-degree murder in the teen's deaths, and received a sentence of life in prison, and a dangerous offender designation. 12. Peter Sutcliffe In this truck is a man whose latent genius, if unleashed, would rock the nation, whose dynamic energy would overpower those around him. Better let him sleep? Sutcliffe's handwritten sign placed on the windscreen of his lorry. On June 2, 1946, in Bingley, Yorkshire, John and Kathleen had their first child, Peter William Sutcliffe. Peter was later joined by another five siblings. Growing up with Peter. He was a really nice guy. He being so much older than me, he was more like a father figure as my dad was never around. He was either working or out at the pub or doing sports events. And Pete used to teach me things that, a father should really, so he was a great big brother. Carl Sutcliffe. Their father John was very jealous and constantly accused Kathleen, of sleeping around. Hypocritically, it was in fact John who was having the affairs. John was a big, burly, sporty and sociable man. His eldest Peter was small, shy and introverted. Peter stayed close to his mother. Peter hated school. He found it hard to make friends, and was often bullied. Once, unable to take any more, he hid from school for a fortnight. When his parents and school realized the reason, they stopped the bullying. As a teenager, Peter bulked up through bodybuilding. He dropped out of school aged just 15. Some of his first jobs were unusual. While not specifically conducive to their criminal pursuits, some jobs held by serial killers are consistent with their morbid psychologies. Peter Sutcliffe... For example, found employment in a mortuary. Harold Schechter the serial killer files. Schechter adds Sutcliffe enjoyed toying with the corpses arranging them, in grotesque poses and using them as ventriloquist dummies. Another job Peter did was grave digging. 
He liked to play morbid pranks with the skeletons, and was seen stealing the jewelry of the dead. In his spare time, Peter visited a waxwork museum. His favorite section displayed the devastating symptoms, of advanced venereal disease. Age 20, Peter was still a virgin. In 1966 he met Sonia Zerma, the daughter of Czech immigrants. In August 1974, he married Sonia, the only woman he'd ever dated. Due to his erratic employment, the newlyweds were financially forced, to move in with Sonia's parents. Unknown to them, Peter was spending his spare money on prostitutes. Together with a friend, Trevor Birdsall, he'd cruise Yorkshire's red light areas. In June 1975, he got his HGV license. His lorry driving job allowed him to come, and go when he pleased. What triggered the ripper? One theory is that a bad experience with a prostitute, led to Sutcliffe's violent hatred of sex workers. Another is that in trying to reconcile the loving mother, he had idealized with the sluttish adulteress his father had portrayed her as, Peter followed the same sexist stereotyping evidenced in many male-dominated cultures, each woman was either a pure virgin mother worthy of a sacred love, or they were a sinful whore. And if they were the latter, they were less than a human, and killing would be more the eradication of an infestation than of murder. As he later stated, I were just cleaning the streets. Over the next savage five years, Peter Sutcliffe would murder 13 women, and viciously attack seven others. During this period, he was a devoted husband, and seemingly ordinary guy. How can you do that and then come, and have Sunday dinner with your mom, and smile and laugh and just act like nothing's happened? Carl Sutcliffe, Peter's brother. Another theory is that Sutcliffe was reacting to Sonia's many miscarriages. Peter desperately wanted to be a father. Then in 1975, 29 year old Peter was told that, his Sonia would never have children. It's noteworthy that Peter often mutilated the stomach, and torso area of his victims. Was he unconsciously acting out the belief that, if his wife couldn't have children, nor should others? Soon after being told he would never be a father, Peter made his first attack. Three quarters of a century after Jack the Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe took up his vengeful attacks on prostitutes. He would go on to kill more than twice, as many victims as his Victorian forerunner. 13. Rosemary West. Serial killer Rosemary West murdered at least 10 young women. Most of them were dismembered, and buried in the cellar of her home on Cromwell Street. Their behavior extended beyond the family circle when, in late 1972, they engaged 17-year-old Carolyn Owens as a nanny. She was incarcerated, stripped and raped. Despite threats that she would be killed and buried in the cellar, Owens was able to make an escape, and reported the Wests to the police. Charges were brought against them. Incredibly, despite his existing criminal record, West was able to convince a 1973 court magistrate that Owens had consented to the activities. Owens was too deeply traumatized over what, she had survived to give testimony. The Wests both escaped with fines. Rose was pregnant at the time with their first son, Stephen, who was born in August. Over the next several years Linda Goff, Lucy Partington, Juanita Mott, Therese Siegenthaler, Allison Chambers, Shirley Robinson and 15-year-old schoolgirls, Carol Ann Cooper and Shirley Hubbard all became victims of the Wests. After brutal sexual attacks, all were murdered, dismembered and buried in the cellar under 25 Cromwell Street. Rose had several more children, and daughter Louise was born in 1978. Not all Rose's children were believed to be fathered by West. Barry joined the brood in 1980, with Rosemary Jr. following in 1982, and Luciana in 1983. The children were aware to some extent of the activities in the house, but West and Rose exercised strict control over them. West's sexual interest in his own daughters didn't wane either, and when Anna Marie moved out to live with her boyfriend, he switched his attentions to younger siblings, Heather and May. Heather resisted his attentions and, in 1987, told a friend about the goings-on in the house. The Wests responded by murdering and dismembering her, and burying her in the back garden of number 25, 
where son Stephen was forced to assist with digging the hole. Eventually their activities drew the attention of Detective Constable Hazel Savage, who oversaw a search at Cromwell Street, in August of 1992 that led to their arrest. On December 13, 1994, West was charged on 12 counts of murder. He hung himself in his cell while awaiting trial. Rose went on trial on October 3, 1995. The jury unanimously found her guilty on 10 separate counts of murder on November 22, 1995. She was later sentenced to life in prison without parole. Rose refused to accept her fate, and launched appeals in 1996 and 2000, claiming variously that new evidence clearing her had come to light, and then that huge media interest had prevented her from receiving a fair trial. The 1996 appeal was rejected, and she dropped the later one. She remains incarcerated. The West's home at 25 Cromwell Street, or the House of Horrors, as it was dubbed by the media, was razed to the ground in October 1996. In its place is a pathway that leads to the town center. Rose was again the focus of media attention in January 2003, when it was claimed that, she was to marry Dave Glover, the bass player of rock group Slade, following a courtship via letters. Glover disputed that there was an engagement, and said the media attention over his letters to Rose had cost him, his position with the band. 14. Scott Lee Kimball In a 147-page letter to his family, serial killer Scott Lee Kimball for the first time admitted, his full responsibility in the deaths of his four known victims, according to a summary of the document obtained by the camera on Wednesday. Kimball, who committed the murders, while working as an informant for the FBI, pleaded guilty in 2009, to two counts of second-degree murder. Despite his guilty plea, though, he maintained that, while he was involved with the deaths, other people were present and, in two of the cases, fired the shots that killed the victims. The letter is in the hands of the FBI, and a law enforcement source with knowledge, of the investigation confirmed its authenticity. According to the summary, Kimball said he was responsible for the death of Casey McLeod, 19, of Westminster, and disposed of her remains, though he did not plan for her to die. Kimball reportedly wrote that, he was the only person present when McLeod overdosed on alcohol methamphetamine and excycontin that he gave her. Casey McLeod disappeared on her way to work at Subway in 2003. Kimball, who was dating McLeod's mother, was supposed to give her a ride that day, but he earlier claimed he went hunting instead. McLeod's body was found by a hunter in Jackson County in 2007. Kimball had previously admitted to being present, when McLeod overdosed but said that other people were there. The summary says Kimball also confessed to killing Jennifer Markham, 25, of Aurora. He previously said he facilitated her death, in a Utah Canyon in 2003, but someone else shot her. He reportedly writes in the letter that, he prepared a hot shot to kill the single mother, and exotic dancer with an overdose of heroin. Her body has still not been found. Scott Kimball led investigators to the remains of La Ann Emery. 24, of Centennial, in a canyon near Moab, Utah, but he had maintained someone else shot the woman, who was the girlfriend of Kimball's former cellmate. According to the summary, Kimball admits in the letter that, he shot Emery twice in the back of the neck, when she tried to escape him. Kimball also repeated his confession to the murder of his uncle, Terry Kimball, 60, of Westminster, in the letter. Ed Coet, Kimball's cousin and the author of a book on his crimes, has seen the letter and confirmed the details in the summary. He said Kimball knows the FBI has the letter, and is prepared to be interviewed again about the crimes. Coet said Kimball is concerned with the salvation of his soul. Scott does not want to go to hell when he dies, he said. 15. Ian Brady. On the night of July 12, 1963, 16-year-old Pauline Reed became their first victim. She was kidnapped by Henley, while on her way to a local dance, then driven up to where Brady was awaiting their arrival. Reed was raped, beaten and stabbed before being buried. Four months later, on November 23, 1963, 
12-year-old John Kilbride disappeared from the vicinity of the market in Ashton Underline, never to be seen again on June 16, 1964. 12-year-old Keith Bennett disappeared while on the way to his grandmother's house. His disappearance was not noted until the next day, and a massive police search revealed no clues. Hindley had in fact lured him into her car, with a request for assistance in loading some boxes, then rendezvoused with Brady on Saddleworth Moor, where Keith was taken. By Brady, to a gully next to a stream, then raped, strangled and buried there. On the afternoon of the Boxing Day holiday, 1964, 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey disappeared from the local fairground, and again a huge police effort, bolstered by volunteers, and unearthed no clues as to her whereabouts. October 7, 1965 proved the turning point for the police, when Myra Hindley's 17-year-old brother-in-law, David Smith, arrived at Hyde Police Station with a horrific tale of violence. Knowing Brady through the family connection, Smith was initially beguiled by Brady's unorthodox and violent politics, but this changed when he arrived at Hindley and Brady's home, on the evening of October 6, to witness Brady killing 17-year-old Edward Evans with an axe. After Evans was finally throttled with a length of electrical flex, Hindley and Brady joked about the mess, and also told Smith of other victims buried on the moors. Concealing his horror for fear of meeting a similar fate, Smith assisted them with the cleanup, before returning home to tell his wife and alert the police. Convinced by Smith's tale, police and reinforcements arrived at Brady's home, found the body of Evans in an upstairs bedroom, and arrested Brady immediately. Brady claimed that there had been an argument between himself, Evans and Smith that had got out of hand, denying that Hindley had anything to do with the murder. She remained at liberty until four days later when police found a document in her car describing in detail how she and Brady had planned to carry out the murder. The investigation would probably have gone, no further than the death of Evans, if Smith had not mentioned Brady's claim that, other bodies were buried on Saddleworth Moor. Already familiar with the various unexplained disappearances, police were able to pinpoint the area favored by Brady and Hindley, and began digging for the bodies of the children who had gone missing in the area over the previous two years. The naked body of Leslie Ann Downey was found on October 10, 1965, followed 11 days later by the body of John Kilbride. Despite discovering the two bodies, the police had only circumstantial evidence against the pair. Fortunately, a more thorough search of their home led to the discovery of a left luggage ticket, which led in turn to a locker at Manchester Central Station. There. Police found sadistic gadgets and pornography, including photographs of Leslie Ann, bound and gagged in Hindley's bedroom. A tape recording was also found, on which the little girl could be heard crying, and begging for her life, as well as the voices of Brady and Hindley. Her mother, Ann Downey, was forced to identify the voice on the tape as that of her daughter even with the mounting evidence against them. Brady and Hindley denied murdering Leslie Ann trying again to implicate David Smith. They claimed that Leslie Ann had left their home unharmed, and that Smith must have murdered her later. The evidence linking Brady and Hindley with John Kilbride's murder was not as strong, but proved sufficient to charge them, with the result that they were charged with the murders of Edward Evans, Leslie Ann Downey, and John Kilbride. Despite exhaustive searches, the bodies of the other two victims could not be found, and no charges were brought. In February 2006, Brady sent the mother of victim Keith Bennett a letter. In the letter he complained of his treatment at the high security hospital saying, he was being kept alive by force feeding for political purposes. Brady also claimed that he could take police to within 20 yards, of where Keith Bennett is buried. Staff at the hospital believe Brady was able to send the letter via third party. As of 2011, Brady was the longest-serving prisoner in England and Wales. 16. Maxim Petrov Maxim Vladimirovich Petrov, born 1965, is a Russian serial killer, convicted for the killing of 12 people in St. Petersburg, between 1999 and 2000. Petrov, nicknamed Dr. Death by the Russian media, was a practicing doctor who targeted patients, 
from a local health center, killing them by lethal injection at their homes then robbing them. In 1997 Petrov began robbing his patients by visiting their home, unannounced, and usually in the morning, when relatives would be at work. He would then measure their blood pressure, and suggest they needed an injection, which anesthetized them. While they were unconscious, Petrov stole their possessions, even taking rings and earrings from his victims' bodies. The first few victims did not die, instead waking up later after he had left. Petrov committed 47 robberies until his arrest in 2000. Petrov committed his first murder on February 2, 1999, during his 30th robbery, when he was interrupted by the daughter of an anesthetized patient, who returned home while he was stealing. He stabbed the daughter with a screwdriver, and then strangled the unconscious patient with a stocking. After this, Petrov's modus operandi changed, he began to use a lethal mix of a variety of different drugs, to inject into his victims instead of an anesthetic, so that the victim would die, and so the police would think that, the killer had little medical knowledge. Petrov would then set fire to their homes to destroy any evidence. The police did not release a photo of it of the suspect, thinking he would soon be caught. However, it took until the following year for them to realize, how the victims were being selected. All were included in the same list of lung patients, who had undergone a fluorography, which he found in a local health center. Using this list, they identified 72 possible future victims in an operation, called Medbrat, male nurse, involving 700 police officers. They arrested Petrov when he visited one of the patients on January 17, 2000. On his arrest, Petrov admitted to the murders, but recanted his confession a few months later, blaming it on the intense psychological pressure he had endured while in custody. Various possessions stolen from the victims were later found in his flat, though he had already sold others at the market. Six of the patients who were not killed were seriously injured. Petrov was suspected of committing 19 murders, but tried for just 17. In 2002, Petrov was found guilty of 12 murders, and was sentenced by Judge Valentina Kudryashova to life imprisonment. 17. Robert Picton. Canadian serial killer Robert Picton was dubbed, the pig farmer killer due to his profession as a farmer and tendency to kidnap, and murder women. His number of victims is anywhere between 6 and 49 women. He killed from 1983 to 2002, when he was caught, and sentenced to life in prison. It began as so many of these sensational cases do, with almost no one noticing. The Robert Picton trial is a lot, like a snowball falling downhill. It doesn't seem like much when it starts, but by the time it reaches the bottom, it's become an avalanche. While the families of the victims are expressing hope that, their long ordeal has finally reached a courtroom, they remain infuriated that police ignored their concerns, about missing loved ones for almost two decades. At first, authorities admitted they were baffled. In the case of these missing women, we don't have a suspect, in fact, we don't have a crime, against. And Renan of Vancouver police agreed in April 1999, Police kept up the hunt, if reluctantly. We don't have any crime scenes, against. Sarah Blur related two years later. We don't have any leads like crime scenes, or anything like that to help us uncover more facts. They finally formed a task force as it became clear, a serial killer may have been walking the seedy streets of East Vancouver. By then, 31 women had simply vanished. But authorities obviously found what they were looking for. On February 6, 2002, dozens of police officers armed with search warrants, for firearms offenses raided a pig farm in the suburb of Port Coquitlam. Two weeks later, on February 22, one of the property's co-owners, Robert William Picton, was officially charged with the murders of Serena Besway and Mona Wilson. They would be the first named in what would balloon into the biggest murder case in Canadian history. They would not be the last. By October 2nd, Picton would stand accused, of 15 counts of first degree murder. The case is massive and so is the investigation. It takes five long years before it will reach a courtroom.
and the case reduced to only six counts of murder out of 26, to make it easier on the jury. Picton has pleaded not guilty to the horrifying charges against him, and there are predictions this proceeding could last a year or more. 18. Russell Williams. Colonel Russell Williams, a decorated military pilot, became one of Canada's most notorious serial killers, when it was discovered that he killed, robbed and raped multiple women in 2009 to 2010. He was sentenced to life in prison in 2010. Williams began breaking into homes near his Tweed cottage in 2007, and near his Ottawa home in 2008. He scoped out the homes of neighbors, making certain no one was home, and stealthily made away with women's lingerie, and other personal items. Many of the victims, attractive women, it appears, were totally unaware their homes had been burglarized. After 62 break and enters and attempts, Williams graduated to sexual assault in September, 2009. He broke into two homes near his Tweed cottage, and forced women to do certain sex acts. He also photographed them. No penetration was involved, but it is believed he ejaculated. Meanwhile, the comparatively harmless fetish break and enters continued in the Tweed areas and in Ottawa. Williams stalked the women, often entering homes multiple times. He broke into one of the victim's homes following his assault on her. Police, for a brief spell, suspected the colonel's neighbor was good for the assaults, but never the colonel. Unlike most sexual serial killers, who assault and kill simultaneously, leaving no witness behind, Williams was escalating. He was also breaking another rule of serial criminals, he knew some of the people whose homes he was invading, and he would also know his first murder victim. In November, 2009, he killed the co-worker he'd stalked. Marie France Camo, 38, died from asphyxiation. This time, there was penetration. And then, the break-in enders stopped. By February, 2010, Williams' urges were back. He kidnapped, sexually assaulted and murdered Jessica Lloyd, 27, a Beauville resident whose absence was immediately noted. Williams was getting sloppy. A tire tread at the Lloyd home was later matched to his sports utility vehicle in a police roadblock. Called in for questioning at the same time police were poised to execute search warrants of his properties, Williams was initially uncooperative but as police relayed news of what they'd found to his interrogators, the colonel confessed to the sex assaults and murders. He later attempted suicide in his jail cell. While unlike many serial killers, he does have something in common with Paul Bernardo, both showed a pattern of escalation. He also stuck close to home, keeping to his comfort zones. 19. Peter Tobin. After he raped and killed, Peter Tobin sometimes sought sanctuary in religious groups. With a killing history, that stretched from Glasgow to Brighton. Could police have caught not only the Scottish 1960s Bible John serial killer, but also the English 1980 child murderer of the babes in the woods? And with 1,400 separate outstanding lines of inquiry for the police still to follow, could Peter Tobin be the UK's most prolific sexual serial killer? Peter Britton Tobin was born in Johnston, Renfrewshire, an area southwest of Glasgow. He was one of eight children with four brothers and three sisters. By the age of seven, a disruptive nature sees him sent to reform school, and a minor conviction later lands him in a young offender's institution. But he grows into smart and handsome man, and finding work as a chef in Glasgow, he spends his weekends dancing, frequenting a club called, The Barrowlands. It was there that aged 22, he met his first wife, Margaret Mountney, just 17. At first, he's a true romantic, taking her for long drives along the banks of Loch Lomond, and introducing her to his polite, but now frail and elderly parents. Everything changes when they move into their East Glasgow flat. Their union is marked by repeated drapes, beatings and house arrest. Tobin cuts the throat of his wife's puppy, just to stop it yelping, and when she complains, he beats and rapes her at knife point. He later uses the knife inside her, cutting her so deeply that neighbors are alerted when she bleeds through the ceiling. Their intervention saves her life, 
but her internal injuries are so severe that she will never have children. In 1993, after a move to the Hampshire town of Hoved in the south of England, Tobin uses his son as bait to lure two 14-year-old girls to his flat on the pretext of babysitting. Once inside, he threatens them with a knife and forces them to ingest a drug, Mtreptalin, an antidepressant that can cause drowsiness and dizziness. He then sexually assaults one and buggers the other. After being interrupted by his son, he turns on the gas, and taking his son with him, he leaves them to die. Miraculously, five hours later, one of them wakes. Despite having her wrists and ankles tied, she manages to ring the police. Tobin evades capture by changing his name to Peter Wilson, and hiding in a religious community called the Jesus Fellowship. But his callous crime is highlighted on the BBC program, Crime Watch, along with his photo. His new community report him, and he's arrested. In 1994, Winchester Crown Court hears how he treated the girls as cruelly as a cat would treat a mouse. He pleads guilty and is sentenced to 14 years in jail. The authorities believe they have dealt with and detained a sex offender. They have no idea that they have let slip through the system a serial killer who has killed and will kill again. In May 2004, he's released and moves to Paisley, Scotland, near to where he grew up. Being a registered sex offender, he avoids detection by changing his name. He finds work at a church. It is here that he will commit one last savage crime. It's the discovery of this that will reveal his true history of violence. 20. Huanlin. Huanlin was born in China in 1949. Although he only achieved a primary school degree, he called himself a miracle doctor practicing medicine illegally. In the 80s he is convicted of fraud, kidnapping, human trafficking and murder and it is in prison that he decides to practice as a doctor starting 1993. In 1997, he faces another trial and he is released, allowing him to focus on selling his medicaments. These were prepared with herbs and with sodium sulfate, which, in large quantities, is poisonous. Wanlin also thought that water was the cause of many diseases, and urged his patients not to drink it, leading to dehydration. In 1998 he was expelled by the local authorities because of the illegal practice of medicine, and moved to Hen in June, continuing with his illegal activities. In addition to herbal medicine practice, he practiced Qigong thanks to which in order to heal the patients, he then does not even need to touch them, only having to transfer them his Qi. He called himself a miracle doctor, and sometimes gave his diagnosis without even visiting the patient because all he needed was only to have a quick look at them for a few seconds. His care, however, rather than cure his patients, ended up killing them. In fact, there are about 146 deaths connected to the self-appointed doctor. The police, however, could only prove three of them with certainty. In 1999 he was arrested again, and sentenced to only 15 years in prison, term he would only serve partially. This could happen because in China, at the time, there was no licensing system for doctors, system which was introduced thanks to this case. This country has a great tradition of herbal medicine, but the reputation of Huanlin, who claimed he could cure cancer and AIDS, is also due to China's health care system. Not everyone can afford health insurance, finding themselves forced to fall back on less expensive methods, but, alas, less effective and in some cases lethal. 21. Steve Wright. Steve Wright aka the Suffolk Strangler, killed five prostitutes in 2006. The English serial killer was caught ten days after his last murder and sentenced to life in prison. He is currently serving his life sentence and may go on trial for his connections to the murder of at least two other women. Wright met Pamela Wright, the shared surname was coincidental, in 2001 in Felixstowe and they moved to the house in Ipswich together in 2004. Wright had always admitted that he used sex workers, and had done since he was in the Merchant Navy, and continually throughout his life. In Ipswich he admitted he went to certain massage, and saw in establishments that were actually brothels. 
Throughout his trial he had stated that he had used professional sex workers on many occasions, including three of the victims and when his partner began working night shifts, and their sex life became almost non-existent, he returned to using professional sex workers who were based on the nearby streets, procuring a dozen in the final three months of 2006. Between 30 October and December 10, 2006, Wright murdered five sex workers in Ipswich. Forensic evidence led to his arrest on 19 December. At the time of the murders, Wright was working as a forklift truck driver. He was found guilty of all five murders on February 21, 2008. On the following day, he was sentenced to life imprisonment, and the judge recommended that he should never be released. It was announced on March 19, 2008 that Wright was to appeal his convictions, citation needed, but on February 2, 2009, it was announced that Wright had decided to drop this appeal case. Prostitutes nicknamed him Mondio Man and Silverback Gorilla, because of his hair color and stocky build, and some said he liked dressing up in tight women's clothing, and wearing a black curly wig. Tiny flecks of blood were found on the back seats of Steve Wright's Ford Mondia, and partially matched the DNA profile of Paula Klenl. Wright is still being investigated in connection, with other unsolved murders and disappearances. He is one of a number of high-profile murderers or sex offenders, to have been identified as possible suspects in the Susie Lampleyou case. He had worked with Lampleyou on the QE2 Ocean Liner during the early 1980s. Lampleyug went missing in London in July 1986, and was legally declared dead in 1994, but her body has never been found. However, the Metropolitan Police have stated, that this is not a strong line of inquiry. Cleveland Police have not ruled out a link between Wright, and the murder of Vicky Glass, a heroin addict who vanished from Middlesbrough in September 2000, and whose naked body was later found in a brook on the North York Moors. In June 2012, criminologist David Wilson suggested that, the killer of Norwich prostitute Michelle Bettles may have been right, but his theory was dismissed by the police. Bettles was strangled in March 2002, and her body was found three days later in Woodland. 22. Victor Sainko. Victor Sainko and two accomplices were responsible for the deaths, of 21 people in 2007. The Ukraine murders became well known across the globe, when one of the many video recordings, of the horrific crimes was leaked on the internet. Sanko was reportedly trying to get rich off, of his snuff videos, but that motive was never proven. He is currently serving life in prison. Shocking crimes happen around the world on a daily basis, but most are almost completely unknown. This disgusting murder spree isn't well known in the US which makes it even more shocking. In 2007, a gruesome snuff video made its way through shocking video sites. It showed a victim being murdered by two young men. Those boys were the Dnipropetrovsk Maniacs, also known as the Hammer Maniacs. They were from Dnipropetrovsk, Ukraine, and went on a spree of bludgeoning members of their community. There were 21 deaths total, but no real motivation to explain the violence. It just goes to show how arbitrary the act of murder can be. The first of the Dnipropetrovsk murders took place in 2007. 19-year-olds Viktor Senko and Igor Sopraniuk. Sopraniuk walked through town, carrying hammers. As the boys passed a woman, Sopraniuk suddenly spun around, attacking her with the claw of the hammer. They killed her. Then, they continued to do so until they were caught. Soon after the first murder, the boys killed a man sleeping nearby on a bench, similarly bludgeoning him to death. The next week, two more bodies were found. And then a third. Authorities were beginning to worry they had a killing spree on their hands, one that kept getting more brutal with each victim. The killers were very proud of their atrocious acts, often taking pictures and creating videos. As the murderers progressed, the victims showed signs of torture and mutilation. One pregnant woman was found, with her feet is cut out of the womb. 23. Junko Ogata. A Fukuoka common law couple were sentenced, to hang Wednesday for torturing and killing seven people, 
who shared their dwelling between 1996 and 1998, in a case whose only evidence was the testimony provided by the accomplice, and a woman who managed to escape the mayhem. The Kakura branch of the Fukuoka District Court said Futoshi Matsunaga, 44, the mastermind, and his accomplice, Junko Ogata, 43, must hang for murdering five of Ogata's relatives, including two children, and the escapee's 34-year-old father. The pair were also convicted of fatally injuring Ogata's father, but the court ruled they had not intended to kill him. Presiding Judge Tashinabu Wakamiya called the couple's actions brutal, and unprecedented. The court said the couple conspired to kill six of their victims, and Matsunaga was the mastermind and Ogata his willful executioner. Matsunaga immediately appealed the sentence to a high court. Ogata's lawyers said they would consult with her on whether to appeal. The couple confined and assaulted their victims, to extract money from them. When the money ran out or the pair, feared they would be discovered, the victim was killed, and the corpse was dismembered, and thrown into the sea, the court said, noting several of the victims were forced to bore huge sums, of money before they were slain. Some of the victims were ordered to take part in the killings, and dismembering of the bodies before they were murdered themselves, according to the court. The couple tried to destroy all traces of the crimes. Because police found no physical evidence, including the victims' bodies, the prosecutor's case was based on testimony from Ogata, and a 21-year-old woman, who escaped from the pair department, where she had been held captive and tortured with electric shocks. The court deemed the two women's statements, and court testimony as reliable. Ogata spoke candidly and in concrete terms, including facts that were disadvantageous for her, Judge Wakamiya said. The murders came to light in March 2002 when the woman, then a teen, escaped and alerted police. Her father was one of the victims. Throughout the trial, Matsunaga denied having committed murder, claiming he only abused the victims, because he did not like their attitude and did not intend to kill them, because they were his money trees. He insisted that Ogata committed the murders on her own. Ogata basically owned up to the charges during the trial, which started in May 2003. But her attorneys had asked the court to spare her life. Ogata claimed Matsunaga abused, and manipulated her into a physical and mental state in which, she had no choice but to obey his orders. During a court session in March, prosecutors called Matsunaga the mastermind, who lost his sense of right and wrong, while Ogata was a loyal executor of, his, instructions. The couple's relationship was a necessary element of the crimes, like two sets of wheels, the prosecutors said in a statement, adding that the murders were deeply connected with Matsunaga's abnormal desire for money and his self-centered nature, which caused him not to care if others were destroyed. The couple began their relationship in 1982, and in February 1985, Ogata left her parents' home in Kurum, Fukuoka Prefecture to live with Matsunaga. Matsunaga and Ogata moved into an apartment in Kitakushu with the teenage girl and her father in October 1994. In February 1996, the 34-year-old father died from repeated physical abuse. The following year, six members of Ogata's family, her parents, Takashi Jinshizumi, her sister, Riko, and her brother-in-law, Kazuya, and their two children, Ai and Yuki, were forced to live with the couple in the Kitakushu apartment. All six were slain between December 1997 and June 1998. Takashich, 61, was electrocuted in December 1997. Shizumi, 58, Riko, 33, and Yuki, 5, were strangled between January and May 1998, while Kazuya, 38, died in April 1998 from physical abuse. Prosecutors were unable to establish whether AI-10, who was killed in June 1998, was electrocuted or strangled. The death sentence was what prosecutors had demanded, 